Welcome to the second installment of the Looking Into Wine podcast, season two. After a small break, we are starting again speaking about something that I wish it was available while I was doing my advanced studies, Capstone, California. Capstone, California, the new website developed by California Wines, is an up-to-date information resource on California wine, with a contribution from uh, many of the state's wineries, along with an outside team of top industry professionals, educators and authors, which is just brilliant considering the amount of information available on California wines. Capstone California also offers four levels of wine certification, and my favorite are the aerial map of the region. We speak to Evan Goldstein, Master of Sommelier, the man behind the creation of this project, to get some insight on it. And while I had him on the show, we explore some of the history of California wine and ask a few questions from his own website. Hi, I'm Matthias Carpazza, and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and winemaking can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process, and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey looking into wine. Welcome to the Looking Into Wine. I'm Mattias Carpazza, your host. My guest today, since the 1990s, has created wine education programs, wine training, and service hospitality schools. He's a master sommelier, a founding board member, and a former chairman of the Court of Sommelier. The, his most recent endeavor has been to create and supervise Capstone, the, com- the comprehensive study of California wines with the California Wine Institute. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Evan Goldstein, Master Sommelier. Mattia, happy to be with you and very much looking forward to our, our conversation. Uh, so I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, I have been using uh, the, the Capstone and uh, there was uh, the collaboration we're doing with uh, the California Wine Institute. And I got very excited because for me, California wines has always been one of my uh, Achilles heels. Uh, I struggled a bit uh, learning about it and when I saw this capstone I started using it myself I was very impressed with it and to speak to you then you produce it I mean it's incredible. Uh, I mean what what is this um, what is capstone and where can people find uh, absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, capstone uh, California is is a creation, as you mentioned, by the California Wine Institute um, in concert with myself and several of my colleagues, several of whom are master sommeliers, a couple of masters of wine, etc. And it really is a comprehensive one-stop shop for all information about California wine. It was launched... Um, last year, uh, although the development of it, as you can probably imagine, Mattia, took some time uh, prior to that. But we sort of felt strongly as a group working on this, um, and the Wine Institute obviously driving it, that, you know, when you are as the fourth largest producer in the world of wine, and it's interesting for people to understand, just to put um, folks in account. So the United States is the fourth largest producer of wine on earth. And California, if it were its own country, would be the fourth largest producer of wine on earth because literally the state of California produces some 84% of all of the wine made in the United States, 90% of what's actually exported outside the country. So people who are not here, if they're going to know anything, they're probably going to know California as well. But we found that our educational support uh, of this um, was lacking. And obviously in this day and age where everything is done online and through the internet, etc., we felt that it was really important to, to, to uh, aggregate it to in one place, not only so that everybody who is looking to understand about California wine had a particular, but you know as well as I do, and you, you, know, you, you speak of, you know, a lot of people when they go out and they don't know anything, they go to Wikipedia, and my God, you know, Wikipedia is not where <laughs> I would go to find accurate information. So clearly the people who uh, are, are creating it need to ensure that, um, you can get people there and make it as comprehensive as possible. Yeah, so you want to have reliable information, uh, up-to-date uh, statistics and your maps, which I love. I, I love the maps. And how, how did you produce this map? And for 
Yeah, the maps and the flybys, you know, the, the rich media elements were so important because, you know, after a while, anybody, no matter how excited you are to read, gets bored just looking at, you know, page after page of static web content, a few pictures here and there. But we felt strongly that um, two things, one for wine, certainly maps bring things to life. And literally of the 139, 140 AVAs that there are in California today, there is, to your point, a dedicated uh, AVA map for each one um, that you can either look in color, there's a way to print it as well too, you can download them into presentations. And we felt that was important um, because, you know, getting good accurate maps of print quality level are, are, are hard to find in this day and age. The other thing that we felt was important is that, you know, with all the technology that's out there, to um, give people an opportunity to experience things sort of in a more um, uh, live sense. So we yeah. created these, these flybys, these aerial visits of different wine regions, um, making use obviously of Google Earth and other types of technology but then stopping along the way to see where they were, incorporating things like um, fog patterns and such that help create a lot of our coastal um, uh, cooler climate areas and all that and bring it to life uh, for people. And um, I'm glad that you, uh, that you <laughs> yeah. enjoy them. Actually, it's a UK company uh, that, that okay. I believe is doing it. And um, we felt very um, strongly that, that if you can't physically go to a place, it's the next best way to see it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm a visual learning and I was very impressed with them. So how long did it take to produce this, the website and is this still in development? What, what's what's going on? Yeah, yeah. It, well, it, it's taken a long time. I remember probably about two plus years ago at this point in time, maybe closer to three. Um, I sat down with Honor Comfort. Honor is the uh, vice president of international for uh, uh, the Cal California Wine Institute. And Honor and I, you know, go back for many years. We used to work together uh, on other projects for other companies and stuff like that. And she asked me one day to meet her. I remember the day vividly at a wine bar in downtown San Francisco. She says, I have this idea that I want to go over um, with you. So, so we sat down, ordered a glass of uh, delicious California wine. And um, she sort of outlined this uh, very audacious but powerful goal that she had of the creation, a one-stop um, destination for all things California uh, that would be um, as deserving of its its being as California is of being the fourth largest producer in the world. So clearly, you know, there was some existing material there, but a lot of this stuff was going to have to start from scratch, from literally the architecture of the website itself, dividing up into the, the different areas, um, finding the people in addition to myself to, to write and do all of these things. So, so it started then. It took roughly uh, probably about 14 to 16 months before we posted anything live, you know, and, and so we've been working behind the scenes, but then posting it live. And then we've been adding on and adding on uh, not only to the content itself, which you can find um, in the, the guides uh, by variety, by region, by topic, but also in the accompanying curriculum um, and testing that people can do. Because one of the things we wanted to do was for people who were interested um, in doing so that they could be qualified, if you will, as almost, you know, at level four, you become an ambassador of California wines, but at levels one, two, and three, building on your knowledge and being certified with diplomas, lapel pins, all of that other stuff, so that when you put that on your CV and it says you passed level two or level three of Capstone California, whoever your prospective employer, you know, knows they don't have to worry about your California wine knowledge. Okay, well, I mean, I did the level one myself, and I, I, I found it very comprehensive. There was a lot of different uh, topics, and I've been looking forward to do the other levels in, at some point in the future. Um, so what, what are the targets for, for this, uh, for this uh, project? Yeah, that's a good question, Mattia. I would say at least initially, the lion's share of people who will either be directed there uh, by other people or who will stumble upon it probably by accident will probably be the trade, which is to say professionals in both the on-premise, uh, off-premise world, cruise ships, um, duty-free, anybody who wants to learn about wine there. But, um, but, but you know, we've also seen that a lot of interested consumers are, are coming there too, not necessarily to take the tests and go through curriculum, as it were, but simply being um, directed to a place where if they wanted to learn about the different AVAs of California that they can, if they want to learn about different grapes and how those grapes uh, are grown and where they're grown and how they compare to other places in the world where they're grown too, 
it can be there too. So, so the thing that's very interesting is although the target audience, um, at least originally um, conceived, was probably trade mostly and internationally mostly, one of the beauties of the internet we know is that there, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have borders. It doesn't have uh, ways of doing that. So we're finding that a lot of American people are using Capstone California to grow their own wine knowledge. People in the trade are, are sourcing it. There are templates there to create your own presentations, etc. So there's a there's a wonderful um, uh, every person use for it. Although we're certainly seeing, at least initially, the lion's share of the people being in the trade. Okay, I mean, I I would imagine then it would grow and trickle into other the part at the other consumers. I mean, um, what what is the next uh, step? So what are you adding on? What what are the el- next element? Yeah. So, so at this point in time, and as you mentioned, you know, we launched with the core and the core had, you know, primary growing areas and AVAs, the primary varieties and such. So everything is sort of building from there. And then obviously the curriculum that accompanies um, the, the, the initial things is, de- is directly related. So as an example, you can't put level three curriculum on when the appropriate guides are there. Um, that aren't on the site yet. So at this point in time, um, we launched with level one. Level two came in relatively quickly and is now complete. We are in the process of adding in level three information slowly but surely. And levels one and two curriculums, I believe, one is certainly live, two is live too. Three will be before this year. And then to your point, we'll be adding over for probably about the next year. Um, we'll be we'll be finishing things up. And then of course, we've got to completely revisit it all the time because this is this statistics change. There are more AVAs, the harvests in a particular vintage. You know, when we wrote it and initially it was working 2019 harvest information. Well, now we're in 20 and 2021. So there's going to be an ongoing update uh, for it as well, too. Again, the beauty of the internet is it allows you to do that. But we fully anticipate, you know, continuing to build strength to strength. When we started with Capstone California, it was only in English. Now it's in French. Now it's in Japanese. Now it's in German, other languages. So we ultimately anticipate it being uh, accessible in 18 different languages, as well as um, multiple uh, levels of curriculum and guides. Okay. And you're collaborating with the, some of the producers that are also guides for some of the key producers and yes. work with that side as well. Exactly. So we work, we're working hand in hand, of course, with the various AVAs and with the various um, consortiums, you know, the Sonoma County uh, Vintners, the Napa Valley uh, Vintners, etc., to ensure their information is up to date. And then we work with individual wineries uh, for everything from interviews to um, ensuring the links are correct, etc. So it really is a, a holistic effort. I know when we launched not only internationally, we also launched nationally to the membership of the California Wine Institute so that the wineries themselves are aware of what's going on, can ensure not only that their own people are going through it, but also that the links are correct, that their information is correct, so that the whole process becomes um, as intended. Okay, well, I mean, it is a place where you'll be able to find 99% 99% of the information you need about California wines, which is great. I love, uh, I love this from uh, the big states, and I'm loving this comps that where you can find accurate uh, information and a reliable source, which is very important, especially for people who have uh, also my listeners, and most of them are. I know they are students or professionals, so for, the, for me and for them to find a, a place where to find all the information about California is going to be great. And the, web, the website, again, is called Capstone. But, uh, Evan, I think because I have you here and I know you are an institution on, on California wines, I ought to ask you a couple of questions on also on the great uh, California wines. Um, I wanted to check. I mean, I also have a couple of questions, a few questions from the website Capstone as well, from the level one. But I wanted to ask a couple of questions. How how did the originally the the history of wines? How did they get to California? The first wines. Right. That's a that's a that's a great question. Um, and first of all, you know, it's important to know that when the first people arrived. Uh, on this land that is now, of course, the United States of America. Um, there was no state of California. California is on the far western start part of the country where most everything really was begun in the east and worked its way uh, west over time. California at the time was part of um, what they called New Spain or España Nueva, which came directly from the conquistadores. 
you know, Christopher Columbus and Magellan and all these other people establishing South America, Mexico, and um, owning the territory that would become California. So as you can imagine, a couple of things, very much like South America, as well as Mexico at the time, and um, what is now the west coast of California, there were no native grapes there. Native grapes exist in New York, uh, in the East Coast, the so-called uh, Labrusca grapes and Muscadine grapes down in the South, East of the United States. But what we know of as grapes today, primarily vinifera grapes, didn't exist here. So those didn't even come to California until the 1830s. But the first grapes that were brought here were the same grapes that were brought uh, to South America and to, to Mexico, which were the Criolla grapes, the Criolla grapes, from Spain, from the Canary Islands and places like that. So the first grape, the most important grape in the state of California from the first establishment of grapes in the 1760s was the, the Mission grape or the Liston Prieto grape or Pais or uh, Criolla Chica, whatever you want to call it. That was the grape that was planted. And as, as um, the first planting started through the Jesuit missionaries who established a wine in California in 1769, in the uh, uh, mission at San Diego de la Cala in the city of San Diego, what is this? It worked up 21 times as they formed the Del Camino Real, stopping in Sonoma County, but established churches, planted grapes, established churches, planted grapes. So that was really the first establishment of grapes and sacramental wines that were there. Then in the 1830s, um, a Frenchman by the name of, appropriately, Jean-Louis Vigne uh, came from Bordeaux, and of course, it had to be, right? And he planted the first vinifera grapes um, in what is today downtown Los Angeles. And um, what's interesting for most people, when most people, certainly yourself, probably your colleagues, when you think about wine, you think of Napa, you think of Sonoma, you think of the North Coast, but wine itself really started in, in Southern California. It started in, in Cucamonga, it started in Los Angeles area, it started around San Diego um, and, and Temecula and all those areas there, and then gradually worked its way up north. Um, and it started again with sacramental mission grade and gradually migrated over to vinifera. So it took a long time. Um, and then, as you know, when those first grapes came over uh, in the 1830s, and came over from France. As you can probably imagine, if you do your, your thinking, those grapes had uh, phylloxera on them. So okay, over time, yeah, it devastated our own vineyard. So uh, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a whirlwind in a process to get where we are today. Yeah, I mean, I, well, for me, it was, uh, I mean, I know the uh, mission is still around in California. You can still find some uh, mission planted, in very, lit very little of it. But for me, it was also, while I was doing uh, the, the level one, uh, how like seeing it and there were like 3,000, 3,500 wineries before the prohibition then they went down to a hundred it really, it was striking how many wineries are there at the moment because the numbers are pretty <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's it's interesting. If you look at it, there are there are about forty four hundred bonded wineries in California. Now, when we say that, some of those are what we call virtual brands, which is to say they're not brick and mortar. They might custom crush at a particular winery. They may be negociant type labels or whatever. Um, so the number of actual brick and mortar wineries is probably roughly about half that, maybe a little bit less. But there are forty three hundred and ninety plus different labels there. That represents over six thousand in different wine growers um, in depending on who you believe 46 or 49 different counties over the 58 that make up California um, of which most people know two three Napa Sonoma maybe Paso Robles um, but it's a it's a it's a daunting number but I think what's really interesting that you brought up is that you know, we had this very difficult period in the United States called Prohibition, which ran from 1919 to roughly 1933. And um, during that period of time, alcohol was forbidden. And there was, of course, illegal alcohol, uh, you know, boot, you know, bootlegging through Canada and bringing it up through Mexico and places like that. Uh, but the wine industry itself was basically destroyed. There were two, um, three exceptions for this. Number one, of course, was for religious reasons. The church had to keep and a couple of wineries were allowed religious exemptions to produce wine for the church. The second was for medical reasons. So if for whatever reason your doctor 
prescribed you alcohol at some level. There were wineries uh, and distill, I mean, that were allowed to make uh, alcohol for medical purposes. We joke that during Prohibition, a lot of people got sick and a lot of people found religion, right? <laughs> but the third, the third piece of this, which a lot of people don't know, but it's very important to wine today, is that um, a clause was created during this period that allowed for the production of home winemaking. So each person um, of legal drinking age was allowed to purchase grapes and make wine for themselves up to, I forget how many gallons, That's but a certain amount. And because of that, you know, this whole started, you know, these were the first garagist winemakers, right? These were the first home winemakers, many of whom fell in love with the idea of wine. And many of today's cult and best winemakers started um, from having traditions that were passed on because of home winemaking or hobby winemaking yeah. that had wow. been passed down from generations. So the reason why people um, make wine today at home is because they legally were allowed to do so with these laws that happened in Prohibition that birthed the whole thing um, going out there. And a lot of the grapes that got shipped out of state on railroad trucks um, were, were made by people to then take some of these grapes that they did and made their own wine. But also, you know, they, they, the, the people were, were very, uh, very smart. They were very crafty. So when they would ship out all of these grapes and things like that, it, they would say, like, do not add yeast <laughs> to this, which was basically a uh, wink, wink, nod, nod, uh, the recipe of how to make wine. Quite funny. Okay, well, that's amazing. It was, I never heard of this, uh, and that's fantastic. So, I mean, if, it leads to just one of my questions I wanted to ask you. What is for you like one of the factors that you wish about uh, like it would be more discussed about about California wines and why what why Yeah I, I mean I think there's a couple of things that are happening you know you, you've got to start somewhere and I think starting you know from producing an initially bulk wine or jug wine and then moving into varietal wine uh, was sort of the first of these steps. And then a lot of the um, initial technology and education that helped birth places like the University of California at Davis or Fresno State or Cal San Luis Obispo today and their um, excellent viticulture and viniculture programs were the next steps in doing that to create um, quality wines, maybe not necessarily the most complex wines, but then sort of followed up by wines of aspiration, wines that used oak, wines that were doing things like this um, to, to sort of take it there. And today where you're at is, you know, lots, you know, there's, there's wine is very much um, a part of the DNA. It's not, you know, sort of a, a weird thing like it used to be. When you see wine represented in the movies and on television, you know it's really become mainstream. And with that, there's explosions into that and people sort of start self-segregating into different areas. So there's still a lot of people that drink their, you know, very happily, their 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 $6 bottle of Chardonnay or Cabernet that, that comes out of the state. Um, and they're happy with that, two buck chuck and beyond. But there are more and more people who are aspirational, who are not only looking to quality wines made from certain grapes that they know, but they look to very specific places. So, you know, to your point, you know, people know that you need cooler climates, for example, to make really good Chardonnay. But so people are seeking even cooler climates. So, you know, the, 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 the West Sonoma Coast or Marin County or the Santa Rita Hills or, you know, places like that that are very cool, that are on the, that are border, that they get cool climate fruit just ripe enough to do so but not too ripe so that, you know, we're seeing this sort of movement there and the things that people grew up on, like really um, lots of new oak and bigger, higher alcohols and things like that. People are moving away from that into more, more focused, more bespoke um, artisanal styles that are, you know, um, representative of what people like to drink and what they're learning on today. I mean, for me, I'm seeing this movement and I, I spoke to a producer in California and I can see this movement happening, exploration of like the mountain areas and this is more an exploring, it's an explorative moment for almost uh, outside the, the, the key region, or which uh, the more famous key region, Napa Valley and um, Samoa. What other region are you sort of seeing that really have interesting for you or 
that people should look at. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that you know, it's it, it, you would be um, you would be wrong not to speak of the prominence of, of the of the big ones. So Napa Valley is, you know, if you ask most people, name something in California, they all say Napa Valley. Napa Valley makes fabulous wines and has been making wine since the 1830s. Having said that, today, and although there are over you know 500 wineries with tasting rooms um, that one can go to in Napa Valley by appointment or direct today, and over 1,700 registered brands within Napa Valley, which if you think about that, um, that's like, you know, almost half of California, right? Um, nevertheless, it's only 4% of what we make. Sonoma County right next door, which is the largest premium county in California is 6%. So together, and where you're going with this is, you know, most Americans and most certainly everybody abroad only knows about 10% of California wine. And there are a lot of other areas. So the areas that I think are starting to get interesting today beyond Napa, beyond Sonoma and the AVAs that are embedded within the would be places like um, up north, Mendocino County um, located is, is very interesting and in making some very good wines, not that big, but very, very good. If you work north and east of that, you have the Sierra Foothills area around Amador and Plymouth and Fiddletown, Winters and cities like that. Old gold country, you know, so some very old vines can be found there because after the gold rush of the 1840s, um, you know, they sort of went hand in hand together. Um, there are other areas that I think people are rediscovering like like um, um, Livermore, which is where some of the, you know, the original budwood, if you will, for all of the Cabernet almost that's in California came from, you know, one guy, Jim Kincannon, making wine in the Kincannon winery out in Livermore Vineyards or the Wente clone uh, from the Wente winery in Livermore that people know, but they don't know it. So there's a rediscovery of those areas there. Certainly um, small but very famous places like the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, which is technically part of the Bay Area. Um, Ridge Winery would be there, one of our great first growth wineries in California. Uh, people are learning about that further south. Um, you know, not only the largeness of uh, the Central Coast and Monterey County and its appropriate AVAs, of which smaller ones like the Santa Lucia Highlands are becoming more well known. Of course, uh, Paso Robles, and it's Robles, not Robles. If you say Robles, people will know you're not a Californian. But Paso Robles and the entirety of San Luis Obispo County has been uh, sort of rediscovered, uh, particularly for climates and the Rhone grapes and things like that. Southern California, the South Central Coast, Santa Barbara, Santa Inez, Santa Rita Hills. Um, are all important areas. And then there's, you know, just little stuff people are, are just finding along the way and even rediscovery of some of these old vines. To your point, I had a, a mission grape wine from Southern California uh, from, a, you know, a hundred and something year old uh, vines um, just a couple of months ago that was really cool. <laughs> Amazing. So talking of AVA, I just, uh, this is a question from the, from the uh, capstone. Uh, how many, how many, AVA do you have in uh, California? It, well, you know, I, I, this gets back. I believe right now there are 140 based on some information that was there. 138 is where we started. We know for a fact that there was one uh, big one that came up since then. So 148, 100, 139, 140. What you don't know is sometimes between the approval of an AVA and when it actually becomes um, implemented, there can be lag time there. So I think it's 139 to 140 currently. Okay. And um, another question was, uh, and I found very interesting. I, what, what's, uh, what's the name of the mountain range that creates a rain shadow which protect Napa Valley from harsh weather from the Pacific. Ah, uh, well, this of course would be the uh, from oh from the Pacific from Napa. Valley. That would be Mayacamas, of course. So this is the one that's there. You actually have a coastal range. That's kind of, if you're familiar with Chile, you know, you have Entre Cordillera and then you have the Andes. In California, there's a short coastal range in the north that separates the Sonoma coast and protects a lot of that from the rest of Sonoma County. But then you have the Mayacama range, which, of course, goes across on the Sonoma side. People know if this is Moon Mountain, Sonoma Mountain um, and stuff like that. But on the other side, um, you have like Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain and all that. But that's the range. And then on the far side, if you go uh, east of that, you have the Vaca range, V-A-C-A, which um, keeps Napa Valley, an actual valley between the Mayacamas range and the Vaca range. Okay. Well, I think we can happily say that you would have passed uh, the, <laughs> the level one. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> Evan, it was, uh, I mean, it's been fantastic to speak to you. And if you have any 
last thoughts or anything you wanted to add? Uh... Well, thank you, Mattia. First and foremost, it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you as well. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, speak with your listeners uh, about what, you know, the golden state of California and what we're doing here. Um, I, I think I would just encourage folks who are curious to go. The actual website itself is capstonecalifornia.com. And from there, not only can you access all of the free information, the maps, the flybys, the information on the varieties, etc., topical areas, our efforts in sustainability and organics, but you can also get access to signing up for the curriculum as well, um, which goes through a, a different um, too. But uh, capstonecalifornia.com. Um, and, and again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak uh, to you about it and wishing you a great 2022. I'm hoping 2022 is better than 2021 um, yeah. on a health basis. <laughs> uh, thank you, Evan. I'll be sure to put the, the link on the description down below. You will be able to find it. Evan, thank you so much for this half an hour together. It was lovely to speak to you and uh, I hope to see you at some point in California to drink a lovely glass of California wine. In, in the words of uh, Motown's great Smokey Robinson, I second that emotion. I look forward to sharing a great glass of California wine with you over here on this side of the pond at some point. In this episode, we talk uh, to Evel Goldstein, Master Sommelier on Capstone, California, and learning about California wines. A thanks to the California Wine Institute to help with producing this episode. The next episode, for the first time, it's going to be a focus series on a single region. We're exploring the English wine scene with author and master wine Stephen Skelton and producers will be talking about their wines and region in a series of six episodes. Remember to hit the subscribe button and to tell your friends about the podcast. Be sure to go to mattiascarpazza.com and to subscribe to the mailing list. You can find Looking Into Wines on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Amazon Music, and every major listening app. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can donate on mattiascarpazza.com. Music produced by Samuele Di Nardo. Editing and mastering by Tommaso Ascoli. Get right to the romance and find the way to wow this Valentine's with 1-800-Flowers.com. From classic roses and bouquets to decadent chocolate-covered berries, gourmet treats, and more. Surprise your Valentine with 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, get the 18-stem Enchanted Rose Medley for $39.99 or upgrade to 24 red roses for $10 more. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in.